Hi, everyone. I'm Daniela Moody. I'm Chief Technology Officer at URSA Space Systems. And today is a, my, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to be here with uh, Adam Simmons and Project Geospatial to talk briefly about some of the basics of SAR. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start with some slides. Uh, order warning. This is uh, it's really meant to be an introductory uh, type presentation to uh, SAR and what SAR is about. Uh, I know it's a term we've heard um, thrown around quite a bit. And with that in mind, I wanted to see if we can demystify a little bit SAR. So this is gonna be part of a series. Uh, today, we're gonna focus on really the basics of SAR. What is it? Why is it so special? What's hard about it? Uh, and if it's so hard, why do we actually use it? So uh, I am, as I mentioned, CTO of Space Systems. We are a, a startup. We are focused on deriving business intelligence and radar-based change detection from space. And hopefully by the end of this uh, presentation, you'll understand why we're so excited to work with, uh, with radar. So uh, this is the outline of what I'll be covering today. Um, again, if you have questions or uh, want to talk about any of these aspects more, please reach out um, via the Project Geospatial Medium, and we'd love to engage further. And uh, I'm going to keep this as high level as I uh, can and not get into too many technical weeds in this particular talk. Uh, we'll save that for the uh, SAR 201. Uh, but first, let's start with what is radar. Um, so I would say that this term was coined, uh, as far as I could trace it, back to 1940. This was in the United States Navy. You can imagine it was uh, back during, during the war. And this stood for radio detection and raging. So the key point to take away there is a lot of the radio frequency-based processing really, really has its uh, nascent uh, beginnings, if you will, in back in the war, back in the Cold War, back in the, the World War IIs, that was the primary way that we communicated. And you see a lot of the advances that we have today in terms of encryption and um, information sharing and whatnot were all started uh, based on a need that we had back then to communicate, to find things, to, uh, uh, to estimate dimensions and so forth. So radar started back then in terms of a term. It was really strictly uh, focused on uh, one antenna, uh, right, and you used it to to find where something might have been. And uh, you obviously are familiar, probably, with uh, with sonar and some of the other uh, technologies that we had back then. And uh, how do we get from wh where are we today? How do we go from radar in the '40s to synthetic aperture radar today? So, really briefly, I wanted to say that SAR uh, or radar, I should say, is a particular focus or topic, I should say, across the electromax, uh, across a particular portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what I'm showing here is a, uh, a summary, if you will, of what you expect to encounter as you go through the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we as humans are very used to thinking in terms of colors and things we see. That is the visible spectrum. And what you can see here, uh, everybody can see my mouse. This is very, very focused on one tiny, tiny portion uh, in terms of wavelength and frequency across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. What this means is that electromagnetic energy is all around us all the time. We just don't see most of it. We see only the visible light or the visible spot, part of the spectrum. So radar in particular is more in the radio waves microwave regime, depending again on wavelength and frequency. This is the non-ionizing radiation. As we go through um, smaller and smaller wavelengths, so tiny, tiny waves, uh, in higher and higher frequency, you end up in the ionizing radiation. And this is where you talk about X-rays and gamma rays and things that we normally use to image molecular level activity, um, you know, atomic activity and so forth. So uh, the key takeaway is wavelength or the size of that wavelength. And you think here, right, it's uh, kilometers, uh, which is the range of the buildings, all the way to the size of a, uh, an atom, for example. The size of the wavelength directly correlates to the size of the objects that that particular light wavelength can image, so to speak, or measure. So that being said, we then look at what are possible sources of such uh, or what propagates certain radiations and where. Obviously, the sun emits um, the broad spectrum of wavelengths. Uh, some of them don't actually penetrate through our atmosphere. So now we're looking at what do we produce directly, right? So we have, as far as sources, we have the AM radio, FM radio, microwave ovens. We're going to have uh, cell phone towers, uh, 5G, 3Gs, and so forth. Um, thermal radiation is an interesting case right here. 
infrared. This is actually a particular radiation that humans produce. It's where we ha all have the night vision goggles, perhaps, and uh, thermal infrared, right? Uh, but that is that wavelength is of the um, comes basically from from heat uh, that humans or other uh, biologicals may produce, uh, warm-blooded biologicals. Uh, and as you move then down into uh, into lower and lower uh, wavelengths or higher and higher frequencies, you now end up with other light sources that are uh, looking more at X-ray um, and other radioactive type uh, decay elements. So wavelengths at this point are increasingly smaller and they have higher and higher energy in terms of um, electrovolts or mega electrovolts in some cases. So why am I bringing this up? As we talk about radar in particular, I mentioned they're in this regime uh, between, you know, it could be uh, a few uh, centimeters to meters, depending on what wavelength we're, we're looking at. And radar in particular is used primarily, you see it in, in the centimeter regime, um, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail, but that should give you a good idea of what types or what scales of objects we're able to image with, uh, with radar. Um, obviously, the reason this was important uh, to, to, to evolve, I should say, as, a, as a mankind was, you know, past the visible electromagnetic spectrum monitoring with, uh, with your standard black and white camera and now uh, awesome cameras that we get from our phones and multispectral imagery and hyperspectral imagery uh, that we fly perhaps on, on satellites. That is a tiny, tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, it does not allow us to, uh, to communicate or to see or to measure uh, as broad a range of uh, phenomenology and objects as we, we are able to do with, with radar. So that was the strong motivation, I say, to start moving into radar and see what specific things we, we can see with radar or see a quote unquote with radar that we cannot see a visible spectrum. So two key concepts I wanted to bring up, and that's something that we, all I've seen, and we probably check this depending on where you live, uh, you check this uh, once a day or once a month, right? It's, uh, it's your Doppler weather uh, radar system. So uh, the phenomenology and the concept is the same. There's an antenna uh, that is, uh, emits an active, so it's an active sensing methodology, emits a pulse at a particular frequency. Uh, in this particular case for radar bands, you're looking at uh, mostly from what I've seen, C-band, um, but this pulse propagates, and then based on the receiving backscatter power, the, um, the, the determination on what the weather might be, what the moisture content, uh, whether it's uh, rain droplets or other debris, uh, that is how the weather Doppler radar gets formed. It's fundamentally radar. And the way we trust it in, 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 instinctively is it does propagate to rain and cloud. So, there is one of the hints of why we are so interested in, in synthetic aperture radar. Radar It provides us that all, all weather, day and night visibility because it does not depend on um, the visible spectrum. It does not depend on solar illumination. It is, um, a pa uh, is an active way of sensing your environment. So in the case of a Doppler radar that we use, that we all are familiar with or we think we're familiar with when it comes to weather systems, this is an antenna that sweeps and it goes up and down, if you will, to create that 360 view or slicing, if you will, of, of the environment to create those uh, movies, right, of, of, of the base reflectivity that we all see on weather.gov or other sites. Conceptually, the same principles apply. Distance and time are um, the correlated uh, pieces here. And then the velocity at which something uh, comes, if you will, towards the radar source or go away are correlated to the frequency. So uh, that is how we're able to estimate with, with a, a weather radar direction or and movement uh, or speed of movement of a storm cell, uh, pos exact position and uh, extent or severity, if you will. So hint number two, radar is extremely good at measuring um, physical properties or geometric properties of your environment in terms of speed, distance, present, presence movement. Can they tell you whether a car is red or blue? Probably not, but they can tell you if a car is in a particular place. So from the single concept of one antenna, one uh, pulse that gets uh, circulated around and for say a weather system, uh, the next 
concept that we see with radar is this a phased array. So in this case, you have a string of arrays, uh, and this is what you describe now as the aperture. So you have a multiple arrays that are controlled via a computer given a particular phase, and now you get what's called a beam forming. So every antenna element emits a particular frequency. They're all um, synchronized or in phase, and this wave, if you will, of uh, mini waves sent, gets sent out. And then based on how this uh, phase array is shifted or oriented, you end up with um, this, this brief beam forming diagram that I, uh, that I was able to include on, um, on, on what the radar will see. So what you see here is also the main beam or the main lobe, and you see these other reflections, if you will, or side lobes. Um, this is something we see also with um, what we see with any radar and RF uh, frequency system. And this has to do with the side lobes or things that happen naturally from, from the sampling, from the um, interfer interference of the various waves. So it's almost a reflection of the main lobe at lower uh, amplitudes or magnitudes. But that is, um, if you will, uh, something that is we have to deal with when it comes to radar. We can't just get the single lobe that you see. You always have these side lobes or reflections they have to deal with. So phased array are great in terms of give you broader aperture. You can get a much better sense of directionality. Say an object is here. With a phased array, you get much better definition in terms of where that object is. Is it coming towards you? Is it moving? And say, if you want to image a, um, you know, something of the order of 10 meters or so, this phased array may be rather large to, to create that aperture. And now the question is, well, we want to fly this thing. And we would like to do this from space. So this is where the synthetic uh, aperture part comes into play. So when you don't have that phased array or physical array to create this expanded beam or expanded aperture for a particular RF system, this is where you're now talking about how can you synthesize such an aperture. So uh, synthetic aperture radar or SAR, the way it's now known, really means you have one antenna and the synthetic aperture that that a displacement, if you will, of um, many sensors comes by the sensor physically moving and emitting those pulses at, uh, with a particular frequency uh, to create or synthesize this aperture. So it's, it's a way to create a phased array, but now it can be flown in space or flown on an um, uh, airborne platform and so forth. So you are doing what you could be doing with a phased array on the ground, but now you can do that with one antenna. Again, very, very tightly coupled and controlled uh, exquisitely by a computer system that can uh, adjust chirping rate, uh, frequency orientation, and so forth. But that is what the synthetic aperture part of the radar comes from. You just create this aperture by using movement of your sensor instead of keeping it static. So in this fashion, we're able to get a lot more resolution or a bigger aperture, if you will, on orbit um, without having to build you know, a kilometer long array uh, in space. So as I described it, this is uh, promised the only tech diagram I'm including here. Uh, so imagine this is your, uh, in this case, a, a satellite platform. It could be, like I said, an airborne platform. It moves in a particular direction. Uh, so this is the track or what we call nadir. Um, so let's say it moves into, um, uh, in this particular direction, the synthetic aperture is developed uh, any time this particular sensor emits uh, one pulse, receives the beam back, goes a little bit further, and uh, emits that chirped pulse again. So that creates now a Doppler shift in a particular um, way of sensing things on the ground. The things that are important here to know is SAR sensors do not look down. Uh, that is, they don't measure things, what we call at nadir. When you put a camera into space for, say, multispectral imagery or all those beautiful Google Earth images that we all, I'm sure, look at uh, anytime we want to find something, those are typically acquired uh, at nadir or below the sensor. By design, SAR and radar sensors work by looking off to the side. So looking in uh, you know, what they call downrange. Uh, so this is off to the side of the, of the sensing platform. And now you have all sorts of really interesting combinations and um, let's just call them features and processing challenges when it comes to figuring out what is it that your, um, your radar pulse 
found in this, uh, whatever the, what happened to be on the ground within that ground range and within that swath width. So synthetic aperture again is formed by physically moving the sensing platform with the radar antenna. And that is what SAR stands for or synthetic aperture radar. But how does it actually work? Uh, and that's sort of a, a question that, you know, I'd say the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Uh, but as with other things, uh, I, I find it fascinating to use example of biologicals. So we, uh, we can, the best way to think about radar and how it physically works, because again, it is not an intuitive way of sensing your surroundings. It is not based on a visual type system or a visual cortex that forms an image. Uh, it is based on RF uh, wave propagation, if you will. So think of echolocating mammals, uh, think of uh, whether it's whales or certain dolphins or bats, some categories of bats that are, uh, they have say visibility challenges, either they are blind or they cannot see because there is no, uh, it's dark uh, in deep ocean waters. So what they do is they emit um, an RF pulse that now bounces back over things they have ahead. And the only time these will bounce back is if they either get completely attenuated um, or they, found, they find something. So based on what the pulse looks like when the bat say receives it back, we can figure out if, uh, if you notice the top left diagram, the frequency or the distance between the pulses or the chirps is the same as when it was sent. And that means there was a static object that it bounced off of. Um, it could be that the particular bug that the bat is chasing is moving away from the bat, in which case now you have a uh, this the Doppler shift, if you will, or the, 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 the pulses get um, attenuated or separated more, if you will. So you see a longer period in between the pulses. That means that the object is moving away from the bat. Uh, or in the unfortunate case that the, bat, the bug is actually heading straight towards the bat, you'll see an increase in that... Um, um, in that pulse that the bat receives back. So this is very similar to um, if you think of how we intuitively know if there is a ambulance that's coming our way when we drive, uh, there is an increase in that pitch or that uh, particular, um, there's the Doppler shift that we hear as the ambulance is behind us or is moving away from us. And that is, uh, that is really a fundamental way that we probably process intuitively echolocation without realizing what we do. The challenge is of course, um, how do we make sense of this and make into an image that looks like the SAR image we're used to? Um, and that I will say is an artifact of human processing. It is not the natural or native way that um, radar and this form of imaging works. But using these techniques, we can measure, uh, as bats do, as whales do, um, we can measure speed, distance, presence, direction of movement, and so forth, which are very unique uh, things that we can see with SAR data. And that is part of, I think, the fascination with this uh, new way of sensing the environment that uh, to, to bring those newer insights into the, um, into the remote sensing world. Uh, the last bit that I wanted to clarify is how precise are these measurements? And uh, I will say, if you've taken a camera, uh, let's say you have two cameras and you've taken a shot of the same uh, you think you have a, a RGB regular camera, uh, or maybe there are two different phones, you take a picture of the same thing. Those resulting pictures may look slightly different um, in terms of their coloration, their hue, their saturation. Um, and that is because cameras to begin with uh, have a different way of acquiring information. With RF propagation, and in particular SAR uh, in this echolocation, um, all the information on the geometric structure and distance is very precise and that is one of the strengths of SAR um, and what makes it very very repeatable uh, for these high precision results. So let's talk a little bit more about how high or how precise are these measurements and how repeatable um, and that is I would say one of the main reasons we, we at ARSA are excited to do analytics with SAR. So I mentioned that uh, electromagnetic spectrum uh, really for when we talk SAR especially um, and I'll say uh, space born star, you're looking at, you know, L, S, what you call C band, X band. Uh, these are the primary ones that you see deployed on space orbits. Um, and these are, you know, low gigahertz values. A uh, couple of the properties there are they are less susceptible to uh, moisture or water absorption. 
more fading. Uh, and the antenna size is larger. So it's not something that you might want to put on a plane, for example. Um, the airborne type platforms are much more, they're typically more X band up to K, U, K, uh, K band. So these are smaller antennas, but they are much more susceptible to, uh, say, rain fading. So you see a lot of the, um, you know, when there's maybe a disaster response or intense uh, rain uh, event somewhere, uh, this kind of radar will not be what you deploy to say measure something. You definitely want to go back more towards uh, C and S band uh, that have less less of a water absorption. So these are all trade offs that you have to consider when you're looking at SAR based sensors. But in general, you'll see that they have a broad range of gigahertz. And what I mentioned is gigahertz are inversely proportional, or frequency is inversely proportional with the wavelength. And the wavelength, which is that periodicity of the sinusoid of the propagated wave, gives you that uh, correlative measure into how, what kind of scale of features can this particular radar instrument measure. So uh, a way to look at it is say, for the most known bands of SAR that I used to, for remote sensing bands, um, X through P band. So these are the equivalent frequencies, which may not mean much unless you're uh, in in more the RF or communications um, community, but look at the wavelength. So the wavelength, you can let low centimeters to 100 centimeters. Uh, so now imagine the kinds of objects that are of that size. So this is where the strongest hint is for, you know, you talk about what can, can, can radar see through ground? Uh, is it ground penetrating? Well, it really depends on this band. So how deep does it go and what objects does it measure or can it see? is really, really uh, proportional to the to the size of the dimension of this wavelength. So uh, think of it almost like the, um, you know, what do you want to measure of the environment of the world? You're not going to be able to see the same things with a P-band SAR than you would be with an X-band SAR. Um, antenna, so anything that you want to, say, have emit a, a wavelength of roughly two to three centimeters in, for X-band, your antenna size has to be or antenna element has to be uh, roughly the same uh, um, size to get give you that aperture. So you end up with very, very different antenna elements in terms of size and design to create these uh, different bands. So I'd say there's been a significant amount of work, uh, especially on X-band and C-band uh, systems. Uh, now we've seen a few more that are going uh, thinking of doing dual systems, combining on the same satellite, an X-band and an L-band perhaps. And the question would be, why would that be useful? Well, um, let me show you. So um, SAR, as I mentioned, started radar, I should say, early on in the 40s. It took until uh, 1978 or so for the first first satellite to be launched officially and start having this free data. Um, it's been around for a long time, but we haven't yet adopted it as broadly as we've adopted, for example, uh, the multispectral sensor, the Landsat missions, the MODIS missions. Even though Landsat started uh, 1972, it was much quicker to be adopted and deployed compared to some of the star satellites. And uh, I, I believe a part of that, a significant part of that has been the increased difficulty in working with star data compared to uh, multispectral data. So why now and why is star relevant now? Um, we have this incredible global collection legacy of star satellites, a lot of airborne collections. We've advanced uh, significantly in, in terms of our RF uh, processing power, understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum, and the knowledge is becoming, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, transcending, I should say, outside of the radar and RF communities, more into uh, the GIS, uh, geography, uh, remote sensing communities. We have, um, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a few slides also, SAR data is not is, is much larger and more complex to deal with. So we really needed that, um, you know, the extra compute and the storage that we now have with cloud uh, uh, available. And uh, is really that, you know, understanding now what is the analytic advantage with SAR data and what can we do with SAR data? And that is what I hope to start uh, talking about today. So we talked about SAR and how we go about understanding what SAR is. Um, how is it different from, um, from multispectral imagery or even uh, 3D camera images? And uh, you know, I'm a big fan of learning from nature. Uh, 
Um, I think it's something that we all learn and observe. And one thing I wanted to point out is multispectral imagery in terms of visual systems, it's something that is uniquely adapted or, or tailored to, to answer our deep human need for processing everything with our visual cortex. Uh, I think we have a great understanding of how the visual cortex works, how we process information, colors mean certain things, but we are limited to three bands. We have uh, RGB vision, uh, those are the wavelengths that we can perceive. Uh, the most advanced visual system out there is this uh, really tiny mantis shrimp that has 16 photoreceptors. They also can sense an ultraviolet, which is really unique, and they also can sense polarized light. So if you wonder why that is probably interesting, uh, think about a time when you might have worn polarized glasses. And uh, you know, if you've done this, my kids certainly have done this many times, they play the whole game of, uh, looking at 90 degrees on and off to see what features they may see from digital clocks versus not. The key point there is with polarized light and polarized uh, receivers, you sometimes may not see things even though they are there to um, a different way of looking at the information. And uh, what we learned from that is, you know, for multispectral, the way we process multispectral images is very, very straightforward. There is a, um, there's a CCD array, whether it's in space or on your phone, um, it captures an image uh, for a particular band and it is a passive array. It doesn't have to send energy out. The solar illumination provides all the energy or that resonant frequency that it needs to capture red, green, and blue band. Maybe some of the other ones like near infrared and close to that uh, visible uh, side of the spectrum. So just as a comparison, uh, I'm showing an example here of the optical view of uh, uh, just a data set, this is a, uh, just an optical image, but I wanted you to think about this while, um, and then I'll show you the example of what this particular scene looks like in SAR data. So when you have a, a multispectral sensor in space, again, you take, you take a picture, you have what's called digital numbers, they now get processed with a, um, a workflow that we understand fairly well. Um, in terms of radiometric correction or what is that uh, band uh, sensitivity to ultimately surface reflectance. So we correct for atmosphere, uh, we correct for geometry perhaps, but fundamentally when you take a picture of something from space with a multispectral camera, the correlation and the pixel correlation um, corresponds already to things on the ground. That is not the case for SAR data. So the biggest question is, why is radar not really an image? Uh, and this is just a cartoon. You can find many of these on online as well. But the bottom line is for a SAR sensor, um, it's an antenna. It sends uh, one beam many times uh, over a pretty broad footprint, and then it keeps sensing. And during that pulse interval, it receives things back that it stores and then sends more pulses. And depending on how many pulses it sends out, it has that much sensing or that much aperture. And then it starts, you have to basically create the image from that. So uh, level zero, and this is usually what you end up, uh, you know, at this point for a multispectral sensor, you already have an idea of what your scene looks like and you've only taken one shot only. Um, at this point, level zero, your image looks um, to some extent like noise because it's not yet an image, it's just an RF waveform. Um, and you also consider this in what's called slant plane. So you're looking downrange, so away from the uh, where the antenna uh, endpoint is, and azimuth, which is in the direction of your um, sensor or, or, or the movement of your sensor. So you have this angular view of what's really on the ground, and you still don't actually have an image at this point. Everything is an electromagnetic waveform, amplitude, and phase. And you still have to get down from that into a, uh, maybe if it's a projected geotiff on the ground plane, which now has more of a pixel look. But to get to that, now this is just one example of a processing flow that uh, it just happens to be the one uh, the European Space Agency is using. But uh, in terms of just having atmospheric correction, this is a whole lot of estimation of these Doppler shifts, the centroid, uh, was it a turp pulse? Was it, what mode was it? Uh, do the rage processing, the uh, azimuth processing, focus it, and eventually get to what's called the single loop complex output. And from that, so single loop complex is usually this part, which is the slam plane. Um, from that, eventually project on the right uh, digital elevation model to get to this ground return detection or GRD output. 
this is a long processing chain and depending on your sensor and the amount of information and how you acquire uh, the imagery it could take minutes to half an hour to an hour i mean it really it really depends and the other part that's important to mention the processing flow has some prescribed steps but some of these algorithms so range processing for example or particular uh, doppler centroid estimation a lot of these have um their options so how i process one image may not be the way a other colleague of mine may process or form another image so some of those assumptions are very important to think about uh, we'll talk more about that in a follow-on uh, session so with that in mind let's go back to that original image uh, this is optical image um, and now this is a SAR image and a couple of things to point out um, even though this looks like an image and we can in appreciate it it is not as um, it's still not it's a formed image and what you see here is really bright spots has no correlation to the fact that this was very green um, in the optical image why the reason this is highly or high, has a high backscatter value it's very bright is because this was a tree canopy meaning that there was a lot of surface roughness or a lot of incoherence if you will so um, everything scattered and you have a lot of volumetric scattering in this case so you have um, lots of bright points uh, whereas a uh, in this particular case the the runway here that was a very smooth service not a whole lot of corner reflectors appears very very dark uh, even though perhaps in other with other sensing modality it might it might appear much brighter or have a higher reflectivity value so key takeaway optical image is sensitive to surface reflectance uh, material uh, properties or makeup SAR is sensitive to uh, geometric properties uh, surface roughness and uh, it's it's much more difficult to interpret in terms of is this a healthy can canopy versus not whereas I can easily do that with an optical imagery so just to keep that in mind um, even though you may see a SAR image that is the result of, of an arduous process of formation um, and it has very interesting features at times or formation artifacts that uh, they need to be accounted for, at least understood, lest you, you become um, uh, tricked, I should say, with, with SAR data at times. So what are some of the taxonomy that we'll be talking about in other series? Uh, I mentioned earlier azimuth range, um, and very important again, SAR images off nadir. So you have the standoff distance or how far to the side or what's that grazing angle um, at which it sends out the chirp one at a time. And then, uh, remember, you, you sense in slant plane, so that's a diagonal plane uh, perpendicular to, uh, to the direction of the beam. And then from that, you still have to project to the ground range, if you so choose, to get to something that corresponds to the ground as an image. Um, this is, um, I always find this kind of diagram fascinating, just in terms of information content. So think here, an image that's sent out, uh, this is the raw data, or when you hear about raw SAR data, uh, what I find is that, is that not everybody thinks raw data being the actual RF original measurement. They think more um, perhaps unprocessed or uncorrected formed image. But when you talk raw SAR, you're talking something like this that's been perhaps a single uh, swath or one burst, and it really looks like noise, uh, even though it does have the information that you need in it. But to get to this formed image from the raw data, you go through uh, some really fun acrobatics with math um, and eventually get here. I think most of us appreciate that, you know, we use the image data from SAR. It is always cloud free. And once you get used to it, it looks lovely. But there is a lot of effort that has to go into getting to that formed image. Um, so range is important, azimuth is important. Um, and those correlate to that resolution, or if you will, the pixel size on the ground, if we think in pixel um, domain. Uh, of your of your sensor and we'll talk more about that in the um, in a subsequent discussion but the other important things that I really want to touch upon now are polarization and wavelength so what are those and how are they um, why should I care right um, so the wavelength I touched upon that in the um, the electromagnetic spectrum conversation um, this is just to give an idea in terms of uh, SAR and this is uh, NASA has a wonderful Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. Uh, I encourage everyone to to take advantage of if you have a if you have a chance. But the idea is uh, compare an L band to an X band SAR. Um, the difference is how deep or how much will um, what will it resonate with in terms of wavelength uh, dimension, 
uh, and actual objects on the ground in terms of forest or soils or um, other surfaces. So the key uh, takeaway here is I have the same scene. One is an L band, one is an X band. And even though it is the same scene, and if I were to take a multispectral view of this, it may look coarser or a sharper detail, but generally um, the, the amount of information that I get in terms of uh, reflection will be similar. When it comes to SAR, these two images look very different, and that is because these two wavelengths uh, really respond or uh, showcase different features that are visible on the ground. So it is not a straightforward feat to just uh, put on top of each other an L band and an X band and accept, expect them to match because they won't, and that's great. Um, so you know, one thing to tailor always is how much, what do you want to see, and what what wavelength will enable you to see that. Um, again, most commercial SAR uh, satellite providers right now um, offer X band SAR, so really great for surface uh, type uh, monitoring and uh, measurements. Uh, but they're not going to be penetrating deep into the canopy necessarily. So um, I just always find that fascinating. Uh, you know, you look at the same thing, you see something very different depending on your sensor, um, and that's uh, directly correlated to the wavelength. Now, the other part that you might have um, heard about is, so you have, for example, a C-band SAR, which is Sentinel. Um, so that's six centimeter wavelength. Does that mean I see on the ground a pixel that's six centimeter wide? No. So the pixel resolution has a lot more to do with that azimuth and range type processing to give you um, how much is image, if you will, or formed in terms of a pixel on the ground during the synthetic aperture formation process. That still has nothing to do with uh, fundamentally the, 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 resol the wavelength, if you will, of the sensor. Where the wavelength comes into play in terms of resolution is when radar is used in its more uh, natural form, which is uh, interferometry. So at this point, you want to measure minute changes that are at the order of the wavelength in terms of uh, surface deformation or displacement and so forth. So now you're not talking about the pixel resolution, which may be 10, 20 centimeters, uh, depending on mode for Sentinel-1, for example. Uh, but you're looking at what can I do with a wavelength that's six centimeter when I process our a different way to get to that interferometric type displacement. So um, we'll talk about this more next time, but these are just some examples um, in terms of displacement that you can find with a C-band SAR like Sentinel. And you look in here, the, the range or the, the, the amount of displacement is now proportional to the size of the wavelength. So that is, I say, one of the key distinction in terms of what can I see with SAR? Well, in terms of pixel, that depends on azimuth range resolution aka how the image is formed um, in terms of what detail or how much um, you know fine detail for displacement or other measurements I see um, that is proportional to the wavelength of the sensor so that can be of the order of centimeters if if, if that's the radar you use so uh, that's going to be a, a you know a very important distinction to keep in mind as we go um, into some of the other concepts with uh, with radar so the other one that's a little mystic at this point is polarization. And uh, I'd argue that this is probably one of the um, parameters, if you will, that are uh, to some extent least explored, or maybe we use them more anecdotally, but uh, this is fundamentally used um, massively, I should say, in uh, things like mechanical-based interferometry or uh, assessment of damage. So the idea is, um, as, the wavelength, as the wavelength is transmitted by the, so imagine this is the antenna element, uh, Polarization has to do with how the wave oscillates with respect to the electromagnetic field. And um, I'll talk about this in more detail in the subsequent session, but what's important right now is uh, you hear about these four configurations that radar uh, or SAR satellites use. Um, vertical transmit, so that is what the signal is when it gets sent uh, in that active ping from the antenna, and what it, uh, what it will receive back. So. Um, you may have vertical transmit, vertical receive. That means this um, uh, guide uh, or antenna guide is uh, oriented the same way. You may also have a vertical transmit, uh, horizontal receive. That means it transmits one way, but it receives it with a, um, on the horizontal element or um, guide, if you will. So what you send versus what you receive is, um, gives good indication as to what, what it might have encountered on the Earth's surface to change its polarization. So 
Um, same idea with the horizontal. This is, again, orientation of the wave oscillation with respect to the um, electromagnetic spectrum and the um, directional propagation. So uh, things like, um, imagine you send this one wave and it hits a very smooth surface like water. Um, you expect a single bounce. And in that case, you might expect very, very limited uh, polarization um, or backscatter received in a, um, a, an HA channel or BH channel. So it really, um, it, it really is something that can be used in conjunction with other sources of information to figure out more about what you're actually measuring. Not every material and not every corner reflector will invert the polarization. It will scatter it a certain way, but only certain interactions with materials will invert or um, rotate, if you will, the polarization of the wave. So uh, that's a way to use uh, SAR and radar in general to, to get more information about what you've, what you've encountered on your way. But when you hear polarization or VVVH, this is what it talks about, uh, what was transmitted versus what is received. And you have sensors uh, that will do what's called a dual pole. So we'll have a dual polarization, or they may be sensing quad pole, and that is they can do all the VVVH, HH, HV combinations. Um, it, it really depends. And uh, that part is, is something that most radar sensors have as, a, as a, an option in terms of what mode they will be collecting in. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's see, we, didn't, we still have more to go on the parameters and how we get to SAR, but I mentioned this image formation chain. So at this point, at the sensor and receiver, when you get this initial voltage from the antenna, this is still a, an RF one dimension type uh, signal. The comparison here would be with multispectral imagery. This is already a digital number that is um, that is formed off a CCD array, and it looks like an image already. So you go through all of these um, chain, I should say, of, of forming forming the SAR image, and really the one we probably you know want to talk more about here is is this one step, which is the image formation. But there's a whole lot of processing of this uh, of the actual RF signal that has to occur to even get to an image that. Um, an analyst may interpret. So I mentioned SAR image is not an image. The reason it's not an image um, directly is, uh, is really something that we form, uh, I guess, for us to interpret easier. But if we don't appreciate the fact that this is actually a, um, a mathematical process to get the signals into a visual pleasing uh, output, we miss some important things. So um, I mentioned, for example, if you took a picture of these, obviously two tanks, um, take a picture of this with two, uh, with, with uh, uh, multi-spectral imagery, they will look uh, like the same, they'll have the same color, uh, regardless of the fact that their particular Tourette, or in this case, articulation is slightly different. One thing you see here is the backscatter that you get from a SAR type sensor uh, changes, even if it's the same object. These objects are static, for example, so, I see things like the shadow of the object, um, and I see backscatter that, unless you know exactly what you might or you're trained, may not really mean much to you. And then you have uh, features like this when you have a moving object. So this can be a train or it can be a boat that moves. And what you see is this um, displacement of the moving object from the actual track. Um, it obviously does not mean that the train is off the tracks. Um, it just means, and remember again, I was talking about the echolocation, as the train moves, um, whether it moves away or towards the sensor, now you get a, a, a direct way to measure by, by how much does it appear to be offset from its actual track. That is that Doppler shift um, that can be directly measured to estimate, say, the speed of the train, because we know, again, the orbitology, and we know what the track physically is. The challenge, of course, is, well, what if I want to run some machine learning computer vision algorithm on this, and it's trying to find train on tracks? Uh, well, at this point, we have to retrain in a different way to find the train off the tracks, I guess. Um, and the same sort of applies as you go through other recognizable um, shapes or monuments, um, like the Washington Monument. Um, this is the San Luis Arch, uh, if you're very familiar with it. What you actually see here is um, you see more the shadow of the object than the actual object. Uh, and what reflects versus not reflects is even more obvious in this uh, picture. This is a, a one of the sea bombers. Um, and, you know, obviously the shape that's visible is the shadow of the actual object. 
the actual object appears only visible in terms of its corner or bright spots on the on the wings and the engines, but you don't actually image um, or you don't see per se the full image object. You just see what reflects back to the to the radar. So in general, SAR image is um, it's always on. It's always available. Uh, you see through clouds, but you need to appreciate what you are seeing in that form image to really make sense of it. Uh, the formation artifacts are many. Uh, I'm just listing all of them here. We will go through actual examples and look through all of them a little bit in the in a following session. But if you heard things like range ambiguity, azimuth ambiguity, nadar ambiguity, um, you know how we interpret and process the image. All of those artifacts come into play depending on, say, how we interpret it or how we estimated the local Doppler frequency shift. Or um, we didn't perhaps do proper silo suppression, and now we have these ghosting effects. Um, you know, I was looking at an image the other day, and uh, you know, you can find things like oil storage tanks that are not at the oil storage facility, but they've been now ghosted, if you will, in uh, in the ocean nearby because uh, silo suppression wasn't wasn't fully in place. So. Lots of really fun effects here that are um, that makes SAR image processing a little bit challenging uh, because it it is it is the, it does have to take into account that processing chain, if you will, to say uh, what do I need to look for and how um, you know is this is this a real um, object or is this just ghosted from somewhere else? Uh, you don't have those problems with multispectral imagery, and this is why uh, my thesis is this is a uh, this is a new way that we have to train ourselves and our analysts to think about things. So what can you see with SAR that's so unique? Um, and how do you know when you actually found something versus you got a, you got tricked? Um, so I talked about how SAR works. Uh, what, is this, what is synthetic about this one satellite? And that's, again, trajectory. Um, the reason this is unique is that, yes, you may not be able to get the actual color uh, or that material um, reflectivity property or the, the, the surface reflectance from a um, from an object correlated to its biomass health or again uh, spectral properties. But what you can say is very adequately and very accurately measure whether um, something is present, whether it has moved, whether it is moving, and what direction is it moving in, how fast is it moving. And those are all things that you get uh, by processing in different ways the SAR um, collected signal. So things that we do, for example, at URSA, and in general, things that you can do with SAR data is, uh, you know, the applications are numerous, but think anything that has to do with measuring 3D objects, anything that has to do with um, measuring uh, changes in intensity or backscatter. Um, I, I mentioned before the two images of looking at the same site with an L band versus an X band. Uh, we use a lot of XBAN for those surface type measurements and um, activity type monitoring. But um, these are just some of the applications. The things they have in common is um, you pick an area and you can measure what's there, what's not there, if anything's moving, or where is it gone perhaps, and get additional insight. It is obviously really awesome when you can correlate particular measurements and views with multispectral imagery. And that's again for the visual context that us humans need. But SAR will work um, all the time, will work on its own. Um, it does not need necessarily the, the optical information. It is just a way to, to contextualize perhaps the, the derived information that you get. The um, other parts that uh, SAR is particularly sensitive to, if you look at, uh, and this is one of the core missions that Sentinel-1 was launched for, was to observe and monitor glacier changes, sea ice, and, and so forth. So again, a lot of that 3D displacement and uh, fine cracks into, into the ice shelf, uh, it, it really is exciting type of research that we can do with SAR today. So one example that I wanna show is, uh, you know, how is SAR so unique? So this is an all formed image of China. Uh, this is in Ningboa on a cloudy day. Uh, you see a lot of structure on the ground with SAR. It looks like an image. So what can you measure with that further? Uh, well, at this point, the challenge number one is visualizing some of the SAR data. So because SAR is an, is an electromagnetic type propagation, it's not an image that's two-dimensional, uh, is what we call a four-dimensional data set. So it has X, Y, Z, as well as a time dimension to it. Uh, we found the, the most useful way to look at SAR data is by visualizing it into um, in, in, in a 3D form. So whether we project it on top of a, 
uh, models that we might be using. This brings a lot more insight into what SAR should look like um, to say measure that displacement of the of the lids to figure out the fill of the tanks. Uh, and that's something that we do at URSA. But visualizing SAR data is probably one of the uh, challenges that we have uh, to, to get SAR data usage more broadly adopted, I think, across across the community. This was just one fun example to showcase. Again, um, SAR data looks very grayscale. You have no sense of vegetation, uh, coloration, anything on the ground. But what you do get a sense of is how fast is this particular glacier moving in a day. And with SAR, you usually have to use these additional features to showcase uh, red flag, blue new type things. So in this case, uh, is the ice moving downward and at what speed? So that was just one example of types of visualization that we have to do. And another example is, I mentioned SAR is really great at starting to use, um, to, to find insights on a regular basis about a particular location. So uh, this is just one example. So Port of Houston, uh, we can image this with a number of different uh, SAR satellites. Let's say we want to look at activity and we want to understand uh, what's the economic pulse there. That's something that Ursa's focused on. That is the observing the changes from space, whatever those changes may be. Uh, so in this case, we see here, uh, now this is a uh, great SAR image. Uh, this may not look uh, as exciting uh, to, to some perhaps as a multi-spectral image, but I'm really excited because it was taken on a cloudy day and you can still see everything. So what can you see? Um, and, and what do they mean, right? So usually we have to go through a contextualizing part, if you will, of, of the observation. Well, where, where are things? What do they mean? Uh, why is it important to see activity there? So in this case, you'll see labeled, you know, is it train tracks, the ship, the docks, uh, what are there? We use uh, multi-spectral imagery again for visual context because this is what SAR looks like now. So you're looking at a GIF of a co-registered stack of images just showcasing ships coming in out of port, uh, cargo containers perhaps being stacked or removed, um, trucks and trains leaving and coming in the station. This is um, straightforward to interpret to a trained SAR analyst. It is not necessarily what you want to start the conversation with because a lot of a lot of interpretation has to go in the what's the wavelength, was it polarization, were they co-registered, uh, how was it formed, what's the Doppler shift, and so forth. So we have to go from all that beautiful SAR processing to derived insights. And, you know, what did they, what, how does it make sense? And uh, one of the other things I mentioned, the visualization part is in the case of cargo containers, um, if you zoom in, this may be the view of the particular um, site in 3D with SAR data. Uh, the part that's really exciting is looking at um, that overlaid over perhaps a, a dam or some other multispectral view for context. The difference here is the SAR measurement gives you that um, near real time, in the moment, uh, precise view and measurement of what the activity or the geometric height, say, might have been of the of the cargo container stack. Uh, but with the guide of the visual uh, optical imagery in the background, you have at least uh, an easier time understanding and processing that information. And uh, that, that's also something that we found very useful in terms of providing insights with SAR data. And uh, the, the story can repeat itself in many different ways, whether it's trains leaving and, and coming out of the station. The point that I'm trying to make uh, that's to me really important is uh, it's sometimes not sufficient just to look at the SAR data, form data, you have to bring in that context to know what you're looking to know what you're measuring. But once you've mapped out the, this is the AOI, this is the site that I'm interested in, SAR then can give you um, a wealth of information in terms of activity and trends and what comes, what goes, what moves uh, to start doing this um, global change from space, which is what URSA focuses on. So we use SAR data exclusively and ultimately we want to get to this view of the world, which is um, we see a lot of things from space, whether it's ships, uh, measure oil, stain, oil storage tanks, coal plants. Uh, we map the activity we want to a particular AOI, and then um, SAR does the rest. And that was just a very, very rapid bliss through some of the things we started doing at URSA, and I'll talk a lot more into other future, um, in a future series, uh, more on the analytics. But I wanted to close with this. Um, with this that you know we are uniquely enabled to do this work with uh, SAR with radar and the one 
Um, my one excitement uh, in presenting this to everyone is that I hope more and more will start using uh, radar. And um, hopefully you'll join us for the next series to learn more about the wavelengths, the polarization, and what exactly, um, what is the art in forming uh, some of these images to get to the analytics? How do we do machine learning with this stuff? Uh, what does it even mean to do machine learning? Um, and what are some of the other concepts are?